see everyone. Uh, it looks like we have a full house today, which house today, which we are very happy about. So keep coming in future weeks. Uh, it makes um, our intellectual atmosphere much more exciting. Uh, and I, I speak especially to the young people here. Uh, so today we'll start with someone from here, uh, Charlie Lowe, um, doing some interesting work. And uh, after that we'll hear from uh, Sultan Hassan from Princeton that will uh, talk about the um, future large-scale surveys. And then uh, Shmuel Viali, where is Shmuel? He used to be a member of the ITC. Uh, and since then his beard grew uh, a little more. And, uh, but we are happy to host him. He's currently uh, in, uh, in the uh, University of Maryland uh, and uh, accepted a faculty position that we will start, like, is it next year? Yeah, in a few months. In a few months uh, in, in Israel. Uh, and he will tell us about the interstellar UV radiation field. And then we'll hear from uh, Andrew Seidiari, again from Harvard. We will talk about the dark energy camera survey. Uh, more sky, less bias, and better uncertainties. So we look forward to that. We'll, we'll start with uh, Charles. Go ahead. All right. Well, thank you. Um, so hi, everybody. I'm Charles. I'm a final year PhD student here working with Karin Oberg. And today I'm going to be talking about how we can trace the vertical structure of gas in protoplanetary disks. Um, OK. So as everyone here knows, that protoplanetary disks are the birthplaces of planets. But they have very complex physical and chemical structures, as is illustrated here in this schematic. And if we really want to understand the planets that are forming in these disks, we need to have a very good idea of what's going on in their chemistry and their physics at very small scales throughout the disk to understand what the properties and what types of planets are going to be formed. And so here, this just illustrates some of the complexities that you're faced with the, when you're studying these disks. Uh, you have gradients in the gas temperature, in the gas density. Uh, these ultimately lead to various snow lines where you go freezing out at these locations. You're having rad uh, you have to worry about things like the stellar radiation here in the center. You have X-rays and UV photons uh, hitting your disk. You have to worry about cosmic rays. Lots of things going on all at the same time in these relatively small environments that we need to understand uh, in detail. And so a lot of the work I'm going to be talking about today started with the MAPS program. This is the Molecules with Alma Planet Forming Scales large program that was led by Karin Oberg, but it was certainly a very uh, diverse uh, and large team, as you can see in this uh, map here. This is all of the team members, and without their hard work over the last few years, I wouldn't be able to show any of these results. But the main aim of this program was to look at five protoplanetary disks in an unprecedented level of detail in terms of their chemistry, look at multiple different molecular lines to try to understand what's going on, particularly in the planet-forming zones of these disks, which meant we had excellent spatial resolution down to the inner 10 AU or so of these disks to really see what's happening in the regions where we think planets and comets are forming in these disks. And that hadn't been done to this point. Um, this is really the most comprehensive view of chemistry that, that we've, we've had of these disks. Now, I'm not going to talk about all that other interesting chemistry. Specifically, I'm going to talk about the structure of these disks and how we can use a few of the lines that we've observed to look at the vertical structure, which is something that's only been possible recently because of this very high sensitivity and high spatial resolution observations. So you can think of protoplanetary disks as almost onion-like. In their vertical dimension, they are vertically stratified. The molecular line emission that we're seeing is coming from the upper layers and not the midplane. So the midplane would be somewhere here where you're seeing lots of millimeter-sized grains, and that's where the planets are going to form. But most of the molecular line emission that we're observing with a telescope like ALMA is actually coming from these upper layers here, these flared, vertically extended layers. Just because these disks are sitting in hydrostatic equilibrium, this is where the lines are going to be coming from. And so the goal. Uh, one of my goals as part of the program was to be able to map out the vertical location of where the line emission was coming from. And again, this was newly possible because of this good data. And we start with looking at CO lines. So all that I'm going to talk about today is CO and CO isotopologues because they're the brightest, they're the easiest to do, and we expect them to be among the most vertically extended lines in these disks. And so just schematically, this is the, the layer that you should think about in your head that we're going to be able to measure. Okay, so just to take one step back and, and motivate why we should perhaps care about the vertical line structure in these disks. Here's a very non-exhaustive list. And so I'll just go through these three reasons. The first is just to be able to interpret the kinematic signatures we're seeing in the gas. 
many times when we look at these disks at very high spatial resolution, we see features such as like this, this velocity kink here, which have been ascribed to planets, perturbing the disk, perturbing the velocity uh, structure, and as a way to actually find planets in these disks. But we really need to know where the line emission is coming from in a vertical sense to be able to be sure what we're seeing is actually a planet or maybe something else. It also matters quite a lot for inferring accurate dynamical masses. We can use the rotation of the gas around these disks to infer the stellar host mass, and in some cases, the disk mass itself. But if we don't know where the line emission is coming from, we're going to get our deprojections wrong. We're going to fit a, a incorrect velocity field because we deprojected it incorrectly because we didn't know where the line emission is coming from. And so we need to know that to actually get the most accurate masses from these systems. And the last one, and perhaps the most important, at least personally for me, would be the chemistry of planet formation really is going to depend on this vertical stratification. Because as I said before, the planets are forming here in the midplane, but we're having lots of molecular emission coming from higher up in the disk. And all of our observations are coming from those higher layers, and we're deriving gas abundances there. We're not deriving gas abundances in the midplane. And so it's not clear currently how well connected those upper layers are to the regions where planets are actually forming. And this is made all the more complicated by, in a few systems, we see vertical flows. We can actually have material at very high elevations flowing down onto forming planets. And so this would also change our idea of the chemical reservoirs that are available to planets. It's not just in their local environments. They can actually see material that's much further away from them, much more vertically extended. Okay, so let's get into how we actually make these measurements. So here is a schematic of a protoplanetary disk that is at some middle inclination with respect to us. And that's an important aspect because we can actually see the full 3D structure of the disk. So assume this is something maybe a 30 to 70 degree inclination with respect to us. The star is sitting right here. This uh, gray uh, disk here is the midplane, And then the two cones are the 12 CO surfaces. So this is the surface from which the line emission is coming from. So here is the upper surface and here is the lower surface. And it's colored here according to the Keplerian rotation of the gas. So here's the blue side rotating to the red side. Now this is an entirely a schematic view of what's going on. How we know this is we use these channel maps. And so for those that don't stare at these channel maps all day, I'm just going to walk you through how this works. What you're seeing here is the spatial distribution of a molecular line of the 12 CL uh, 2, to, uh, 2 to 1 line in the disk around HD16, D296. And each channel here is showing the line emission as a function of velocity or frequency. So as you move across the rows and down, tracing the rotation of the gas here. What you can do is identify a few of these channels and map them back onto the location in our schematic here. So these channels are probing the blue side here. These channels are probing these regions of the gas emission right in the middle. And then these channels are now on the red side. So, but the power of these channel maps is actually if we choose a judiciously choose a channel some, like something like this right here, we can actually get a direct view of these emitting layers provided that we have sufficient angular resolution. Because if you see this, this wedge right here, we actually see both surfaces at the same time by looking at this particular channel. And so this was uh, data from a few years ago. So let's jump ahead to what we Here is one particular channel of the same disk, HD16, D296. Uh, it's at 7.1 kilometers per second. And central star, which would be somewhere right here. But the nice part about this is now we can very, very clearly see where the line is coming from vertically. So I'll just draw this on for you. So this region right here corresponds to that front side, the front surface of the disk. And this region right here corresponds to the back side. And they're very well separated here. We have a very great angular resolution. We can just see this directly with our eyes. The midplane would be somewhere here in the middle where we're seeing the, the dark emission, the, the dark lane right here, where we have CO freezing out. But the fact that we can see these so directly with our eyes means we can relatively easily make these measurements. And so that's exactly what we did. So as part of the MAPS program, we developed this uh, tool called DiskSurf that lets us do this in an automated fashion. So this is just running the same disk and the same molecule through our algorithm. All of the blue points here are picking up the front surface automatically, and the red points here are picking up the back surface. And this does this for all of the channels. I'm just showing you a few examples of how it's pretty accurately finding the vertical uh, layers here. OK, so what does this look like when we run it through uh, a set of CO lines? So here I'm showing the height of the 12 CO line. So this is the, the radius as a function, uh, or height as a function of radius. And here is a corresponding channel just so you can visualize what's going on. So what we do is we identify the front and the back surface from the method that we developed, do the correct deep projections, and then are able to measure the vertical distribution, which effectively corresponds to the separation here between these two surfaces. And we can measure that directly. So what we're actually tracing when we're looking at these surfaces is the tau equals 1 
surface, where the majority of the emission is coming from. Um, and what that means is the 12 CO should be the highest, the most elevated, but if we go to rarer isotopologues, such as 13 CO and C18O, those should probe further down, closer to the disk midplane, because they're less abundant and it will take us more material to get to tau equals one. And in fact, that's exactly what we see. So now if we do the same method for 13 CO here, instead of being as ele elevated like the 12 CO, it's somewhere at a lower uh, elevation here. And you see the same thing in the channel maps. Now, if you look at the separation here, it's quite a bit broader. Now the, the surfaces are moving closer together, again, reflecting the fact that the emitting surfaces are moving closer to the midplane for the rarer isotopologues. And same, same story for the C18O, going to a rarer one. We see now the emission is pretty much consistent with midplane origin, and we're, our emitting surfaces are very close to each other. What's powerful about this method in combining the CO isotopologues is not only can we map from the upper atmosphere of the disk down to the midplane, but if we take the peak intensity at each point here, um, we can actually map out the 2D empirical temperature structure. So now you're seeing this all put together for HD160296, the upper layer here in 12CO, and then the midplane layer here in C18O. And again, the assumption we had to make is that these lines were optically thick, but that is the only assumption we had to make. Okay, so I'm out of time. So we were able to do this for all of the, the disks in the MAPS program, able to get nice, very nice temperature structures here. And um, I will skip now to the end. So turns out we were able to do this for a lot more disks in 12CO, so I'll just, I'll just skip to this main point here. This method is very general, and we were able to do it for another 12 disks from the archive. So here that here the do a lot more analysis and probe things in a much larger uh, sample. So I think I don't have any more time to talk about that, so I will just end here and leave up my conclusions. So happy to take any questions. Charles, uh, from the heights that, that, that you uncover, it, it looks like the height is maybe a third of the radius, and that means that the, the sound speed is a significant fraction of the circular speed at those distances, which means that it's, we're talking about a kilometer per se, or a couple of kilometers per second, and that corresponds to very high temperatures that I wouldn't expect the disk to have. So why, why are these disks so hot? I mean, is that the natural expectation from calculations that they would have such a high temperature in the outer parts? I mean, so it depends on the, the, so the temperatures we actually measure for these disks are no, maybe no greater than 70 or so Kelvin, even in the, the outer oh, region. 70 Kelvin or so? 70, but then yeah. the scale height would be very small. It's Sorry? from turbulence, the disk. Is, is most of the, I mean, are they extremely turbulent in the outer part? Because, uh, you know, a few kilometers per second is much more than 70K, you know? Especially for CO, which is a very heavy molecule. Yeah, so it also, it, so, to some degree, it depends what we're tracing, too, because we're not actually tracing the very top of the disk, right? So there are things above the 12 CO, 12 CO, which is this tracer that we can use, and we're already finding it's very elevated. We expect that if we went to, say, higher J transitions, this is all just two to one. If we went higher up, like six to five, we'd probably be more elevated than this, and probably hotter as well. Yeah, but is that, <laughs> what, can theorists explain that? That's, That's a good question. I don't know. So. Okay. Yeah. I don't know. Uh, I had a question, but I don't know if this answers your, your question. But in a flared disk, these outer regions are directly illuminated by the UV emission from the central star. Right. So you would expect the surface layers to be, you know, warm. Yeah, warm. But at hundred at a hundred day, you let's say at the place where the Earth is, we are talking about three hundred k. At a hundred AU, it will be. It goes like the quarter. Right. So the temperature would be too small to have a flare disk from heating, I would guess, at these speeds, you know, that, so it's really surprising. So one thing to ask is how can you maintain the disk so far? Yeah. Yeah. But well, my, my question was you teased us at the beginning by saying that this may be uh, a new method, an alternate method of determining the mass of the disk. Uh, you didn't come back to that. Where did, where does that stand in the analysis? What, you know, what are the roadblocks to that? Again? Right, that's, that's a great question. So that it's, it's a necessary component. So I, I'm not personally leading any of sort of the, the mass measurements. Um, it's a necessary component to get the velocity field correct. So what you want to do, if you want to measure the, the stellar host mass in these systems, you, you fit a Keplerian velocity field. 
to that. And from that, you can infer the stellar mass. But you would like to know where exactly your line is emitting from, because it's going to change your, your G projection and, and change your, your accuracy there. So that's one way to get this, the stellar mass. And that works very generally. So you can get the stellar mass for any of these systems with uh, very nice Keplerian disks. If you want to measure the disk mass, that's a lot more subtle. You particularly need massive disks, and you need a very accurate rotation curve. Um, and you, you can see the effect of massive disks in that rotation curve, but it's a much, much harder measurement. And there are people working on that, and they definitely need to know exactly this surface well. And they're finding that the surface they assume actually is very sen it changes the disk mass. It's very sensitive to the surface. Um, so it's a very precise thing to do. Eric? Uh, just to answer your question, I think one, one effect is the photoelectric heating. So the UV hits the dust and it releases the power electrons. Yeah, but one has to show that you get these high temperatures. <coughs> it, it, it's not, it doesn't sound natural, you know, the, the kind of result that you described doesn't sound natural, but maybe some exotic heat. No, I think, it's, I think um, that's it. That the, the, the other thing I wanted to bring up is a, a very interesting paper that came out a week ago on the archive. And it relates solar neutrinos to um, the, um, the formation of the solar system, the planet formation. And the idea is that when you look at the core of the sun through neutrinos, uh, the best fit now to the data is actually that the metallicity in the core of the sun is higher than the metallicity on the surface. And the explanation they provide for that is that early on there was accretion to the sun, the young sun, and later there was planet formation, and that consumed the heavy elements from late accretion. So the outer, you know, the, the, the surface of the sun has a lower metallicity than the core because of that. And it's interesting to see if that, you know, agrees with the kind of depletion you would expect from whatever you find in your data. No, so I haven't the, seen that paper. It's interesting. I'll, it's I'll a, yeah, it, a connection between uh, neutrinos and, and planet formation, which is really interesting. So. Uh, the sun is, has an onion structure, apparently, in the list that people never suspected until recently. So just check it out. Very interesting. Um, any other questions or comments? Yes, go ahead. Thanks for the look. So uh, you showed plots with the uh, real extension of about uh, 200 uh, meters. So would it be possible for some of these you have shown, 20 or so, you have shown where the uh, highest in the resolution so you could see closer within about 10 you. Because, so you were mentioning the effect of the communication coming from the cell phone. But it starts at very active, so they need a lot of needle particles in the So you're able to do some radial uh, factor degradation of the ionization of the these particles so you look at further down, but uh, if you wish it, not enough resolution by not doing this. So uh, is there any of these? Uh, yeah, no, that's, that's a great suggestion. That's something we explored a little bit in the math program broadly. Um, so because we do have sort of the best resolution at, in, in a lot of these lines, and so we can get maybe one or two spatial resolution elements in that inner region that you were talking about in the you know, 10 AU or so. Um, and so that's something we did explore. Um, yeah, I'd be happy to sort of send you some of those, those papers. Um, no, so th these things are not isolated. Uh, they're constantly being clobbered by more gas from outside. Uh, that may be. And, and uh, so I think the, the, a lot of the scale high is just gas that hasn't yet dissipated its z-motion uh, in order to settle down to the disk. At the 100 e. <coughs> OK, maybe. Yeah, and, and in fact, there's one disk, uh, Giamariga, in the, in the sample where we actually see it for perhaps late in fall. So we fall seal gas coming in because of the disk still. That might be the solution, yeah. Alisa? Yeah. Oh, thanks, Charles. Um, what's the line with the CO lines at the edges of these disks? Um, what do you mean by the edges? Any, the last pixel you can resolve. Oh, like in the outer? That's a good question. Yeah. I haven't actually checked that. Um, but it's a, it's like at least a kilometer per second. Probably. Yeah. Right, it's probably, probably two or three. Right. Yeah. And so, and then, uh, then the and dust temperature at those places is 60, 70, 80 K, right? Yeah. There's probably not any, I mean, dust out, out there. Right, right. Yeah, no, but it, the, yeah. the, the edge is not, it's not 10,000 K, right? So in other words, I don't think, I think, I think you might be worried about something that's not a concern. I think most of the velocity width is from accretion and turbulence and maybe some of the rotation, but, but the, the, the widths are, you know, a couple of times second is preposterous that it's the right. right, it's not. Yeah, so that's a, an interesting conclusion by itself. Yeah. So. 
Charles, you are doing very well, and good luck with your defense. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs>
and then you kind of recurrently, iteratively uh, recycle the output again into the network. And as you see, as you, you move from one to another, you basically, the bubbles grow till you get close. Basically, this is one of them. From, from white noise, you can basically extract uh, information like this. Um, so then as a comparison between the two, these are different examples for this city field. This is the original ionization field. Um, these are two different models. So that's the first model that is just like basically deterministic. You go from density field to ionization field. And this is the model two where you do this denoising and uh, recurrent testing. Um, so you see this is probably gets much closer to the, to the original one uh, because the model has seen some of these noisy versions during training. And you see here if you compare the two models at the level of the power spectrum, um, you realize that the first model underestimate the power spectrum in all scales. Uh, the second model gets very closer in large scale, maybe probably scales uh, larger than two, uh, 200, uh, uh, larger than 20 megaparsec maybe. Um, but both models, they underestimate the small scale power. That's a very hard thing to do um, in reality. Uh, but then what we have shown here is that you can basically emulate uh, reionization um, simulations and you get maps much, much quicker than the simulation uh, if you are interested in scales higher than uh, 20 megaparsec, then uh, this network could uh, perform very, very good. Um, the second thing is uh, another work by, uh, by Yu Heng from Minnesota, which is we, we were trying to ask another question, right? So most of these large scale experiments, they focus also on measuring like power spectrum or summary statistics, right? So the question is that if we get a summary statistics, can we recover the actual field, right? So the summary statistics could be a power spectrum or something. So the idea for this generative model is to start with the density field, right? So you have the power spectrum or any summary statistic. It doesn't have to be the, the, the power spectrum, right? So can you go from the density field power spectrum to the ionization field power spectrum? And then from here, can you sample? the fields or not, right? So now that's a question whether you have really the optimal summary statistics uh, to recover the large scale bubbles, right? Uh, and then you can make a comparison. So this work is mainly based on, if I give you a summary statistics of a power spectrum or like of, a de of ionization field, uh, can I, re I recover the generation of this? And the idea is basically quite simple. You can start with you, 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 the input you want, which is this one, you can calculate the, uh, the summary statistic you want. So we, we tried two different methods. One is the power spectrum. And the second one, one is picking up in the field really, really quickly. It's called the wavelet phase harmonics, which is um, you convolve your inputs with different uh, filters. Uh, and then you basically extract much more information than the power spectrum. Like these wavelets, they really uh, give you coefficients that capture non-Gaussianities and stuff. So we tried these two, uh, two, uh, two summary statistics. So the idea here, then you start by generating a white noise as an initial step. Um, and then you obtain the same summary statistic, whether it's a wavelet or a power spectrum. Uh, then you can define your loss function, which is basically uh, the, the difference between the summary statistics of the white noise and the, sum and the summary statistics that you are trying to arrive to. Um, and then you try to optimize the noise. So you try to deform the noise in a way that, that it gets closer to this to minimize this loss function, right? So then as you see as a function of iteration, um, the power spectrum, you, you're kind of seeing like a growth of bubbles as you grow, but then maybe after iteration 20 to 100, there is no really much difference between these two. Where by, by uh, the, the 20th iteration, uh, this map already gives you the same power spectrum as this. Um, if you look at the wavelet phase harmonics, you kind of, you see, you start to grow uh, bubbles much more and there is a huge difference between uh, iteration 20 and 100, right? Uh, so that's basically the idea. It's, it's very simple. It's, it doesn't have much of training as than, rather than just optimizing and deforming the noise to give you similar summary statistics as what, what they want. And that's nice actually, because now you can sample from the same summary statistics, you can get a, a, a diverse realizations, you don't have a unique solution, and that can correspond to mimicking like the cosmic various effects and stuff like that. Um, so this is my last slide. So, so these are for like different, this is the input that we want. These are different, uh, this is for, from the power spectrum what you get. 
you have about 90 coefficients. The wavelet uh, phase harmonics gives you about 3,000 coefficients because this is basically like captures more of the um, uh, non-Gaussian in the field. Uh, and this is another form of the wavelets uh, that we tried. And you basically each time, because the noise is different, each time you get a different realization. So if you look at the comparison at the level of the power spectrum, they all roughly give you the same power spectrum. Uh, but something else we can look at is, is instead of looking at the image in the Fourier space, um, you look, uh, look at the image at the linear, like the physical space, and ask the question, what is the distribution of the bubbles as a function of radius, right? Um, and this method based on the mean free bath and stuff. Um, uh, but as you see here, uh, all, all models, they recover the input very good if you do the wavelets. With the power spectrum, you kind of underestimate the, the large scale uh, bubble growth. So yeah, so the idea here is just to use this uh, where wavelet scatterist transform would really capture much more information. And we are able to uh, sample from a summary statistics to generate an actual field, so which is very, very exciting. Thank you very much. Of course, the, the main controversy as of now is the claim by edges that the signal is far greater than expectation. And there are, I just saw a few days ago, there is another experiment trying to test it, and there were claims that it's incorrect. What's your take on whether we did see already a signal that is far greater than expected from 21 centimeters? Oh, on the, the edges? Global, the global signal. The global signal. My take on that, I think it's still, it is a highly debatable <laughs> uh, signal. There are many works that they have went to the data again, and they realized that they don't really uh, see the same signal. Uh, but it's still, I, uh, we, we have written recently a paper with some of, uh, uh, with Aaron and Rahul here, is that we have shown that, um, I think it's still interesting to ask the question, given this detection, uh, what implications can we have in our physical models? And uh, one of the things we found in the paper is that uh, uh, you need probably much more contribution from mini halos and uh, faint galaxies, and you need much higher photon scale fraction to, to recover that, to be able to have a consistent picture between what the detection and the, the current observations we know about the ionization. Any questions? Yes. Uh, yeah, <laughs> how do you know you have the right summary statistic? I mean, if you, you know, do something that optimizes for WPH, you'll probably match the WPH. But if WPH really contained all the relevant information, then you should be able to match other summary statistics when you optimize for that. Right? Would it be reassuring to optimize for one statistic and then check another? Yeah, that's right. That's why we we testing this. There are many things you can test. But the basic idea is that. Um, uh, Data compression is a big thing in the field, right? Yeah. And we wanted to see what is the optimal one that you can really use. And it seems to me the, uh, at least at the level of the uh, distribution of the bubbles and the level of the power spectrum, they look okay. Uh, we didn't test for other things like non-Gaussian or bispectra or whatever. Um, but it's a very simple method, but it really gives you, I mean, also, like, you see, the bubbles are not as, as like, rounded as the input one. Um, so they are probably some differences between the um, input and, 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 and the generated one. Um, but this is a very quick way to generate samples, right? And the hope is that if you have a large sample, you can average over statistically, and then you should be, should be able to capture the same thing. Any other comments or questions? If not, let's thank uh, Sultan. <laughs>
I will not talk about it. Um, cold clouds as cosmic ray detectors, a new idea how we can use dark molecular cold clouds as a way to detect or constrain cosmic rays uh, in the galaxy. Maybe if I have time, I'll spend one minute on this, but today I'll mostly focus on the work about the UV radiation field in the interstellar medium of our galaxy and other galaxies and an analytic model to predict the intensity of this UV field in galaxies. Generally speaking, this all has effect on galaxy evolution on large scales across now at Maryland with uh, Benedict Diemer, a new faculty member who used to be here, and Vadim faculty member who used to be here, and Vadim Semenov who is still here, uh, to build a new star formation model in ISM for galaxy evolution. But this will have to wait another year or two. So the far UV radiation field, um, basically this work started during the pandemic, lonely times where I spent lots of time at home. That's why it's just single earth or paper, but it was fun. Um, so why do we care about the UV radiation field? So there, the UV radiation field really affects so many things in the interstellar medium and uh, in galaxies. So first of all, for thermal structure, if you care about the, the gas, if it's hot, if it's warm, say 10 to the 4 Kelvin or cold, 100 Kelvin, uh, the UV radiation field is the main heating source, at least in our galaxy. Cosmic rays can be important in low metallicities. That's a separate issue. But in most galaxies, UV radiation is the main heating source, and it is the reason why our ISM is multi-phase composed of these hot and cold uh, gas structures. It may even be an important regulator for star formation, as uh, shown by Ivo Stryker and other people. For molecules, if you observe galaxies um, around us, or even at high redshifts, you say you observe CO, or other galaxies, CO is really affected by this UV radiation because that's the main destruction mechanism, photodissociation. So we, to understand observations or simulations, we really need to know what's, what to expect. What should be the UV radiation intensity in the interstellar medium of galaxies of different types and different redshifts? Um, all right, so thinking of simulations, if you have a galaxy, what's the problem? You all just have all the stars. You can just ray trace, uh, calculate what's the distance to that star, take the luminosity, divide by the distance square, include some attenuation from dust, and sum over all stars or clusters, and there you go. But of course, this is very expensive in terms of uh, computational power. And also, it's just nice to, you know, to have analytic model to understand what's going on, how things depend on the galactic properties. So that was the idea of this project. And specifically to answer the question, how the UV intensity changes as you change metallicity. So thinking of high redshift galaxies, first galaxies to form in the universe, or maybe even local galaxies, but just dwarf small galaxies with low metallicities. As we'll see, metallicity plays an important role for, uh, in this process. So first, let, let's look at some scales, some important scales in that problem. So if you have a galaxy and you imagine uh, there's a clusters of OB stars, that's what the things that produce the UV radiation, the far UV radiation we're talking about. Um, there are different scales in that problem. First is the, what's the general scale of the galaxy, say the galactic scale radius of these stars. For our galaxy, it's about uh, three kiloparsecs. The second scale is what I call the uh, event horizon. And that's the scale over which you see the stars. Beyond this event horizon, RD, just dust absorption kills all the radiation field. So even though there's much more stars, you don't care about them. You really care just about your environment upon uh, up until where you can see the stars, and that's basically up to what distance tau equals one. So that's what I call RD. For our galaxy, it's 600 parsecs, but for different metallicities or gas densities, it can change. And finally, the smallest scales is the, the smallest scale is the typical distance between sources, L star, uh, and that depends on the star formation rate. Right? If a higher star formation rate, you have a more more dense, uh, higher density of sources. And for our galaxy, it's typically about 100 uh, parsecs. Uh, so 
I mentioned metallicity, so let's see what happens if you, even before we have the model, just uh, and as illustration, what happens if you change the metallicity here on the x-axis. On the y-axis, I show the UV intensity for a given star formation rate. Let's say you fix the star formation rate, and you just change the metallicity of the galaxy. So if the metallicity is high, say metallicity of 1, you see all these stars in this region, and you sum over all these stars, and you get some UV radiation field. Now you start to decrease the metallicity, you decrease the the tau, the optical depths, you start seeing more and more stars, and therefore the contribution increases and you have a higher UV radiation intensity. And then finally you reach a point where the entire disk becomes optically thin, you see all stars in the disk, the metallicity is very low, and then your UV radiation field saturates, you can't get any more than this, you just see all stars in the galaxy, and that's why uh, the UV intensity saturates. This is a calculation from a kind of a numerical simulation we'll see in a second, but uh, basically the idea is can we get an analytic model to describe this behavior. So we saw there are like three typical scales, the galactic scale radius, the dust absorption scale radius, and the distance between all these stars, and for analytic model you really care about dimensionless quantities, so you want to take ratios of these scales, so you get, basically get two ratios, and you can write this as say two optical depths, the optical depth of the galactic disk tau gal, which is basically the ratio of the galactic scale and the dust absorption scale radius, and the optical depth between radiation sources. That would be the ratio between L star and RD. So that's two dimensionless numbers that you can use for the analytic model, or you can, I chose to use uh, this instead of tau gal, basically the ratio of tau gal and tau star which is the ratio of the galactic scale radius and L star. And this basically tells you how many, roughly, actually x squared times pi is how many stars do you have in the galaxy as a whole. As you can intuitively, in the optically thin limit, only when you get to this very large size, this very low metallicities, you see all the stars, and then you care how many stars there are in the galaxy. At high metallicities, you only see the local environment, and then you really just care about the tau star, the intersolar, intersource opacity. So long, uh, um, yeah, and just before I jump into the result, in terms of uh, n numbers we used to, for our galaxy, um, x is about, this argal kiloparsecs is uh, three, three kiloparsecs, as I said, so this would be of order 40 or so, and tau star is about 0.4 for our galaxy. So for our galaxy, we're definitely in this regime where we'll, you just see the stars in our neighborhood. So if you work out the, uh, I, want, I will not derive this with you. Uh, here some, some games with math, and you get this result, the UV intensity uh, divided by the star formation rate, because it's easy to divide by this because there's easy scaling with the star formation rate. But rather than just being a constant, as we said, it depends on metallicity and other things. Uh, the way it depends, there is first uh, one term that kind of represents the nearby sources or the, the near, nearby stellar cluster. And then this is the first exponential integral. It's a known uh, integral uh, where uh, the uh, tau star is here. That's what we saw in the x. And you can just use it as a formula for, to give you the uh, UV radiation intensity. And it looks like this. In the optically thick limit, um, as you decrease the metallicity from right to left, the UV radiation field increases, as we saw. Then you cross this limit of tau critical. Uh, at this point, the entire radiation, the entire disk becomes optically thin. These contours be anymore. You see all the stars, and you just care about x or the size of your galaxy or how many stars you have. And bottom line, you can increase the UV radiation field by a factor of 3 to 4 for the same star formation rate, and this will affect the thermal structure of galaxies at low metallicities, say dwarf galaxies or high redshift galaxies, and the destruction of molecules like CO at low metallicity galaxies. That's it. is the scale height of the disk, because if you are going to mean free paths that are larger than the, the scale height, photons can leak vertically rather than go sideways. 
So isn't that a sink for those UV photons that they go vertically? That's, that's an ex excellent point. It's actually one of the assumptions of the model, uh, which is not necessarily always correct. It's correct for, for example, for our galaxy. And so I assume the thin disk geometry, so all the um, clusters or the sources of the radiation field have, you know, they have some scatter in the Z direction, but it's small. The assumption is that this scatter is small compared to the L star, to the distance between them. And then you can assume thin disk, and when you're sitting somewhere within the disk, this, you know, small Z uh, variation don't really make a difference, and you can ignore it. But in the other extreme where this, the disk is thick enough compared, again, compared to L star, H is larger than L star, and actually you get into a 3D geometry where you sit somewhere and you see all stars all around you in all 3D directions, and then the integral becomes different. You have a different uh, Jacobian in the integral, and you get a, a different formula instead of E1. It's uh, actually a common, different result, but yeah, it's... Thank you. Um, yes, go ahead. So uh, in addition to O and B stars, there are also other kinds of like, lower mass stars, strip stars and binaries, or white dwarf stars at the beginning of the cooling track that could also give you UV photons. And those are like, less sensitive to star formation, right? So do you happen to know the relative importance of those kinds of terms? Yeah, I, my impression was that, so I'm specifically, I didn't mention, interested in the far UV band, so from 6 EV or so, because thinking of like heating or through photoelectric heating and also photoelectric association of H2, for example, is 11 EV. So in that band, my impression is that OB stars are by far more important than any other sources, but maybe I'm wrong. It occurred to me as you were speaking that uh, one, one way to measure the far UV field, uh, in the Milky Way at least, uh, might be through ice absorption measures. And by that I mean uh, water ice, for example, uh, only stays on a dust grain uh, if it's not far UV photodesorbed from that grain. And so the onset of ice formation, which one can measure if you have a lot of lines of sight, uh, can measure the far UV field throughout the Milky Way. Uh, as, as the UV field uh, increases, the onset of ice formation moves to a uh, higher ace of V, and conversely. And with the Sphere X mission that uh, we're working on here, uh, we hope to measure about 8 million lines of sight throughout the Milky Way uh, and assess the onset of, of ice formation, water and other ices. And it just occurs to me that that might be uh, a different way of no, getting at the intensity of the far UV field. No, that's very interesting to try and think of how to exactly compare. Because yeah, the model would predict for a given star formation rate in the galaxy, which fluctuates between regions, so you see arms or other regions and you know other parameters, metallicity, gradient in the galaxy to expect different UV intensities and to try to it's compare it's that. totally independent way. And we'll look at the uh, large and small magnetic clouds. So if Gary's data confirms your model, you can get tenure. <laughs> <laughs> Don't put the pressure on either of us. <laughs> Go ahead, Eric. Eric, you had a question. Oh, I, I decided that the answer to my question is on the view graph. I'm not sure I <laughs> it. I withdraw the question. Thank you. Okay, any other questions or comments? Yes, please. Do you compare with simulations? Yeah, I uh, thank you. <laughs> I, 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 did, I did comparison with a, first a very simplistic simulation where you just uh, do random realizations of stars of different luminosities from a luminosity function and uh, calculate these rate transfers for different conditions, velocities, densities, and you see the comparison is uh, really good. So this is the uh, diff different uh, relative error and percentage for different observer locations and different parameters, south star and x, and it's usually below 10%. Um, and recently we also started comparing with simulations of galactic disk where things are more messy uh, with uh, Vadim here with his uh, simulations where they do have um, radiative transfer and these are some maps of using the analytic model and radiative transfer. This is some preliminary work, so there are some differences with, that we have to understand. Partially also have to do with the radiator transfer method. Um, but yeah, so people here have been helpful with this. Let's thank Shmur. <laughs>
Uh, hi everyone, my name is Andrew Sadry, and um, today I'll be telling you about the second and final installment of the uh, Dark Energy Camera Plane Survey, or DCAPS-2. So uh, DCAPS was a survey carried out by the Finkbeiner Group, so it has a very strong motivation for dust mapping. Uh, here I'm showing you a 3D dust map rendering uh, of a well, recent dust map based on starlight reddening. We're looking down on the disk here, and you see there's about a third of the disk that's missing in the dust map, and that's the pan stars hole. We don't have high quality, well calibrated optical uh, and near-infrared photometry on which to base this map. And that was in part of the motivation for DCAPS-2. So DCAPS-2 is an optical and near-infrared survey of the galactic plane in five photometric bands, GRI, Z, and Y. It covers about 6.5% of the sky using DECAM on the Blanco. And I find it very helpful to contextualize DCAPS with respect to other large area sky surveys and, and longer wavelength surveys of the galactic plane. And so here's the pan stars hole. And with the first release of DCAPS, uh, we filled this coverage to plus or minus 5 degrees off the galactic plane, and now with DCAPS-2, we extend that coverage to plus or minus 10 degrees off the galactic plane. Uh, in DCAPS, we target, uh, on average, three visits per band across the survey footprint. Uh, we, we have uh, about 1.1 arc second average seeing, better than 10 millimeg relative photometric calibration throughout the survey footprint, and reasonable ground-based astrometry. Here I'm showing you the actual number of achieved photometric G-band epochs across our survey footprint. And we actually make all these sorts of maps at extraordinarily high resolution, so you can see the inner CCD gaps, which is important for modeling the selection function of the survey. Now, um, DCAPS is actually a fairly small program. It's only about 260 hours of open shutter time over about three years, uh, but it packs a pretty big punch in that, oops, uh, uh, in that it creates uh, uh, actually the largest photometric survey ever obtained on a single camera in terms of the number of objects. And so that clocks in at 3.32 billion sources built off of only 34 billion detections over the survey footprint. And what you see, and I want to draw your attention to them, is, are, are real galactic structure. This is real dust that's preventing us from being able to see sources behind them. What you don't see are pointing boundaries between different exposures. And that's really a testament to the quality of our relative calibration. Um, in fact, if you look extraordinarily closely, you'll see a couple bright points uh, of overdensities, and those are known globular clusters, for example. Now, um, DCAPS isn't just great for dust. Uh, uh, it's great in that it reaches uh, really far into the galactic disk, which lets us map out dust in, in uh, 3.32 billion of them. Um, and so let me just show you some of the uh, stellar diversity we have throughout our survey footprint along a, a variety of different beams across the survey footprint. So uh, here I'm just showing you the color magnitude diagrams in each of those beams uh, <coughs> in I versus uh, I minus Z color. Uh, so off the disk, uh, or, uh, out of the plane, you see a really nice sharp uh, vertical disk main sequence. As you move into the dustier regions, it begins to tilt along the dust rending vector in this color branch. Uh, but there's also a bunch of other substructure in these uh, CMDs that we expect to be extraordinarily fruitful for future studies. So um, with that, I just wanted to address uh, two main questions about the survey. One, a survey, and, and really the answer uh, is in large part due to the software. So uh, the first stage of our photometric pipeline is called Crowdsource. It was originally written by Eddie Schlafly, and I'm also a co-developer on that code. Uh, and the way that code works is it takes a single CC single CCD image from, from DECAM. It models a position-dependent point spread function, uh, it finds a bunch of sources, and then it jointly optimizes the position and fluxes of all sources in the image simultaneously. And that's really how it's able to handle crowded limits such as these uh, where, where stars might be overlapping and still get their photometry right. So uh, this is uh, a zoomed-in region of, uh, of our survey and a fairly crowded, uh, crowded limit. This is a real image that I've stretched extraordinarily hard so you can see the noise. And this is the model coming out of CrowdSource. And so if I flip back and forth between them, I think uh, it's quite difficult to find a source in uh, the real image that you can't see in, in the model. Now you might say, um, this isn't all that crowded. Uh, so we can push it even further into a globular cluster in our survey footprint. So this is M62, uh, and we can study how well our photometry works as a function of radius from the center of M62. Uh, so here I'm just showing these cutouts moving towards the center, and I'm just showing the G versus G minus R color magnitude diagrams. And I want you to note two main things. One is that this looks like the same color magnitude diagram, except that you just have a variable faint end cutoff here, which is saying you can't see the faintest stars when there's a large density of bright sources. Um, but also, you can still clearly discern features associated with different stellar types, such as the sort of blue horizontal branch uh, uh, stars, even, even in the center of M62. And that's telling us that not only are we able to do photometry in the credit limit, but we're still able to do astrophysics with that photometry, which I think is extraordinarily important. OK, and uh, the second question that came up in the context of DCAPS that it's extraordinarily important for Roman and Rubin as they begin to spend more time in the galactic plane is how do we define photometric depth in these sorts of crowded fields? 
So the normal definition of photometric depth is the magnitude at which you expect to recover approximately 50% of the sources in the image at that magnitude. But that requires that you have some notion of what a good detection is or what recovery means. And let me just try to show you that that doesn't really make sense in a crowded field. So this is an image from DCAPS. Here's our original solution. There are two sources in the center here, one at 20th and one at 21st magnitude. Uh, you can inject sources at all these little green triangle locations, one of which happens to be in between them. Resolve the image and ask what you get. Uh, so we get this model shown at the right here. Now we have a 19th and 20th magnitude source. And when you try to automate a detection pipeline uh, to decide if a detection was good or well recovered, you generally make two arbitrary choices. You search within some radius around the injected location, and you ask if within that radius there is a source within some magnitude tolerance from your injected uh, source magnitude. And in this case, there is a source uh, within the search radius uh, within 60 millimags of the injected uh, source magnitude. So I think most reasonable choices for these arbitrary choices would say this is correctly accepted and uh, detected. But I just want to challenge that assumption. Uh, because we started with a model that had two sources, we added another source, and we still have a model that has two sources, except both of those sources have now moved towards the injected location and absorbed part of that flux. So it's really hard to decide and, and say whether or not this is a, a good detection. So uh, instead, I consider a related problem, which is how to model the faint limit bias. So on the x-axis here, I'm showing you the signal-to-noise ratio of the injected source, and the y-axis, the fractional error and flux of just the nearest source that's found to that injected location. And you see that there's a nice divergence here at low SNR. That comes from two main effects, uh, the biggest one of which is just a detection bias. So if you say you're only picking up five sigma sources and you have a 4.9 sigma source and it fluctuates high, you detect it. But if it fluctuates low, you don't detect it. That's really the main cause of this, of this divergence. And um, if you account for both of these effects correctly, and I just extract this green line over here, uh, you get a very nice fit to an analytical model, which is shown in gray, which depends on only a single free parameter. And that free parameter is the empirical detection threshold. So you may tell your code to pick all peaks above 5 sigma, but you don't have a good model of your noise and your background. It's not perfect. And this is an empirical measurement saying crowdsource actually only debuns to about 5.85 sigma in decaps. But this analytical relation gives us something quite special. It gives us a relationship between the detection threshold, the 50% recovery point, and the expected fractional bias as an empirical measure of the photometric depth. So you could do the standard thing where you say, I know my point spread function. I know the sky background. Uh, I think I'm debunning to 5 sigma. I'll make a histogram. The median of that will be the monolithic number that I report as the photometric depth for my survey. Uh, instead, you could also say, uh, as a function of the injected source magnitude, what is the observed bias that I have, and when does it cross the expected bias I should get at the detection threshold? That's another measurement that you could do of the photometric depth. Now, um, these definitions uh, have to agree. They're constructed to agree in the sparse limit. But it turns out, over the entire survey footprint, uh, this empirical measure is about the function of depth varies as a function of space. Uh, we know that uh, because, of course, depth varies strongly with source density and crowding. And this is an empirical measurement of that over the entire survey footprint by taking in every Helpix pixel, all injected sources in that Helpix pixel, and doing exactly the same fit, asking when our bias crosses the threshold we'd expect at the detection threshold. And what you can see is we achieved down to 23rd magnitude in I-band uh, towards the galactic anti-center, but you know, only 19th magnitude in, in the bulge. And so I think it's really important that we start to represent variations in, um, <coughs> in, in photometric depth as people spend more time in crowded fields. So um, if nothing else about stars or dust has excited you about uh, using DCAPS, I just want to say that uh, DCAPS actually can intersect your work in a lot of different ways. One of the uses of DCAPS-1 has actually been to put optical constraints on uh, counterparts to high-energy transient events. And I think part of the reason that we've been used so much for that is this really beautiful interactive visualization we have on the Legacy Survey Viewer where you can view all of our images, models, and residuals in all five of our photometric bands uh, on your web browser. And this sort of really nice visualization is coming soon to Worldwide Telescope and Aladdin as well. Um, also, uh, you know, there's a class of people who are very interested in fast-moving objects, uh, such as NEOs. Uh, and, and we've really tried to put all of our intermediate data products out so that we put out not only the band merged and object merged catalogs, but also the single detection level catalogs. So you can actually find those fast movers and link them into orbits. Uh, if you're interested in things like that. Uh, we put these uh, files out in a variety of different formats, so, you know, FITS and LSD, uh, as well as hosting them on Astro Data Labs. They can be accessed via tap queries, uh, via Topcat or your favorite tap engine. And because we put out all these different levels of intermediate uh, data products, we also uh, document all of them so you know exactly what variables are in which extension and how to access and use all of that. So uh, with that, I'd just like to acknowledge the much larger DCAPS2 collaboration who all contributed to this work. All of our uh, software is open source uh, and is broadly applicable. Uh, and I'll just leave you with a link to our survey website uh, and a question of my own before being more than happy to take any of your questions. Thank you.
decades ago indicated that there might be a very small scale structure in the interstellar medium on the scale of AU that people saw variations in the H1 absorption. Okay. And uh, an interesting question is, I mean, you talked about transients, but to see if your uh, conclusions change in time over time scales of a year or 10 years, did you ever look into that? I mean, I'm not talking about specific sources that are transient, but actually small-scale structure in the interstellar medium. Yeah, um, so I mean, we, we have saved all detections as a function of time, but I don't think anyone has tried to look at those sorts of variations. It would be interesting. It would be very interesting. Parcel data does indicate there is. Hmm. Cool. Okay. Any other? Yeah, yes, um, so have, you have this amazingly calibrated uh, Footman catalog for s crowded sources, crowded fields. Have you done comparisons to other large surveys like, for instance, Gaia photometry? How well is Gaia doing compared to you, you guys? Um, so I ha we, we've done some of those sorts of comparisons. Um, let me uh, pull up one of them. We've compared to PanSTARS, which is uh, also a big survey. Maybe uh, you'll accept that as a comparison. Um, that's actually, in part, how we do, uh, OK. I don't know what, why it's being annoying here. Uh, but uh, okay, this, is, uh, this is, for example, um, our, our decaps uh, minus PS1 upon applying a color transform is a function of PS1 R band magnitude and, and all the other bands. And what you can see is that our calibration is extraordinarily good. You can't see these numbers maybe from the back, but you know, uh, the, the offsets between the surveys are you know, sort of millimag level, uh, down at least to the detection threshold. And what you can actually see is this upturn here at, at the faint end is showing you the detection threshold and the detection bias in pan stars because pan stars isn't as deep as, as, uh, as decaps is. So yeah, we've done these sorts of analyses on a couple different surveys. I haven't done them on Gaia. We have done comparisons of the color magnitude diagrams in Gaia versus our color magnitude diagrams. And all of the really cool substructure we see in ours, at least in the bright limit where we can compare them, is present in Gaia as well. Yes, please. Um, yeah, so uh, maybe you said this and I missed it. But uh, so when you're talking about um, you know, detecting these faint sources right next to each other by injecting sources and seeing the uh, difference, um, one of the things that uh, usually comes up in these very dense galactic plane fields is that it, you know, in this regime, you're not really background limited at all. You're completely limited by the source noise. There's sources everywhere. Yep. Is, there, is that a concern? Is, is, how do you deal with that? How do you create a noise model for the image in the regime where it's all source noise dominated? Uh, that's a great question. And it was the subject of a talk that I gave in the spring uh, in the same format uh, to marginalize over different uh, structured backgrounds as well as, in some sense, the neighbors. Um, in the limit where they exactly overlap with background sources, they're just blends, and you, you, you model them as the sum of the two fluxes. And when they're far enough apart that they start to have residuals to each other, you, you can start to do this. Um, but it's, it's hard. Um, and one of the things that we show in our validation section of this paper is that uh, crowdsource and really anything that's trying to optimize the flux linearly like this will make massive underestimates of the uncertainty in the flux uh, at some characteristic uh, distance of separation between the sources. And, and we characterize that. And that's just a problem with the way that we do this optimization. You have to do something much more complicated and more computationally expensive to do better than that. OK, uh, excellent work. Let's think and.